today we've got a project that we had started code reviewing about two or three weeks ago, um, but there was just a lot to it. Uh, usually, well, I can't say usually because we haven't been doing this lo that this long, but um, in a lot of the cases I've seen, we'll just get one class and we'll walk through that class. In this case, Sean sent us an entire project, which was cool and presented actually a, a challenge because um, just trying to figure out where to start w was a unique challenge. But let's just go through it. I'm going to play. It's basically a port of the Oregon Trail. If you haven't played the Oregon Trail, I don't know how to describe it. It's, I guess it's like it's a, definitely a game from like the 80s or 90s, uh, probably the 90s. I used to play it a lot in elementary school. Um, and you're like you're in a caravan uh, traveling to the American West to try to make a new life for yourself. <laughs> and along the way on this journey, you can die of dysentery and you have to get food. But one of the aspects of the game is that you go hunting wherever you stop if, uh, to collect food. And that's the aspect of the game that Sean has implemented here, the hunting part. So uh, as you can see here, we've got a uh, level select. So we'll go ahead and click on one of the levels here. And you can see we've got some animals roaming around. Um, and when you put your cursor over an animal and click, you shoot the animal. And now I've got some food for my family. Hopefully it's not riddled with dysentery. Also, another cool aspect of this is as I, I'm clicking now, I'm missing. When I end the hunt, you can see my accuracy. So I shot 11 shots here. Shots fired was 11. I only killed three animals. My accuracy was 27%. So very cool stuff. Um, he's also implemented a doom level. It's kind of a special level, which is really cool. It's got a Gatlin gun here. So now I'm just blowing away these animals. And uh, another aspect, too, is we got this move here, you move functionality, you click on move, and now you change the location in this particular level. So pretty cool stuff. Let's let's jump into the code here. Well, actually, before we jump into the code, the main driver of this whole game is going to be this game manager class. Um, and the game manager class is, as we can see, by its dependencies. Now we talked about dependency injection dependencies earlier in this stream. You can see that right here by its serialized field, it's dependent on uh, quite a few things. It's dependent on having some wor this world object. We don't know what it is. It's a game object. Uh, it's dependent on the regular ground spawner, the doom ground spawner, air spawner. So, you know, using context clues, we see that these are prefabs um, and they're, they're, spawners so presumably they're what's responsible for creating animals in the scene we've got a rifle chain gun uh and then we've got a reference to regular levels on the doom level okay so i would say my first if i were to say that there's any code smell here it's that all these named things such as level gun let's let's think about it like this you've got level you've got gun you've got spawner and you've got world they are actually all um game objects, right? So they're, they're, they don't have any, I don't see any classes. So um, that's something that I would consider a code smell because uh, even though you have the ability to reference game objects, it's preferable to create strongly, I would say it's preferable to create strongly typed classes for all the aspects of your game because it just makes it very, um, it makes it, it's, you're going to see when we jump into the code, it makes it very difficult to follow uh, the, the programmer intent, if you will, uh, when you're working with game objects and not with something that's strongly typed that has its own set of, you know, methods and, and, and uh, business rules and name, named methods that really give you a hint of what's going on. So let's hop into the code. And uh, what I've done here to make this a little easy, easier, for all of us, <laughs> is I've actually done some refactoring ahead of time, and I've put them into commits. So we're going to jump through these commits, and uh, and it'll make it a lot faster to go through this. All right, so we're looking at the game manager class, and uh, I'm going to try to keep the chat open here. Let me know if I need to uh, make the code larger or if you can't see. But the first thing I'll, I'll take note of is that I don't see any namespacing here. And we talked about namespacing and, what's in, and how that's important in... Uh, carving up your project. If we take a look at the actual project, uh, if we look in the scripts folder, it looks like he has actually broken up his project into subfolders. So we see, see there's a, a weapons folder. Let's take a look at that. There's still no namespacing. 
Uh, so here's where I'd recommend to Sean, and I'm not going to do it here because it's just going to take a while. I have to go and do every single class individually, um, unless there's some fancy way to do it in Rider. Um, here's where I would say, give your project a namespace. We'll call this project Oregon Trail, I guess. So the namespace might be, <clears throat> just to give an example, Oregon Trail. I'm totally misspelled that. Oregon Trail. And then in this particular instance, I would, since we're in the weapon section, I would make this the namespace weapon, Oregon Trail dot weapon. <clears throat> okay. But again, I'm not going to do that <clears throat> because it's just going to take a while to get through all of it. Um, so let's go back to the game manager. That was just the first thing, first thing I noticed. There was no namespacing. The second thing I noticed, and I mentioned this, was this game object. Um, the fact that we're referencing just game objects. We're not actually referencing any strongly typed classes. And I'd like to change that. I'm going to refactor that. Um, uh, also, if I'm going to refactor that, I mean, this is this might just be personal preference. I know we spoke about this, uh, Jason and I. Having your uh, your declarations all on one line actually causes some issues on a human level. The compiler doesn't care. You can do this. This is completely safe. And it's something that I thought was kind of funny, I didn't realize. Uh, the fact that this serialized field um, is is marking this huge declaration, it actually applies to all of them. So that works. But you're missing a couple things. First of all, for readability's sake, personally, maybe if you had something like an int x, y, so you know, maybe you're doing something like int x, y equals zero, fine. I think that's okay. But when you've got all these named uh, variables, it's my recommendation that you split these up. So, oh, sorry. So I would say, uh, let's see if I can do this in one shot, if it's going to let me do this. Split into separate declarations. That This is a refactor. Oh, there is a way. Yes, right-click the folder and clean up code namespaces. There's a way to actually... Sorry, I, I, I'm going off on a tangent here. I just read a comment where I can actually... I might actually be able to do the namespacing uh, wh wholesale like I wanted to. But I, I don't want to mess around with that right now. So, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so, basically, if you check this out, in Rider, you actually get some real nice IntelliSense. For instance, look at this world object this world field, it actually has this, this inspector, this IntelliSense that tells you what the actual inspector value is. That's pretty awesome. I couldn't do that before when they were all in one row. Look at this, regular ground spawner. It's telling you that if we click on this, it, it takes me right over to where this is and it, it lets you see what this object is in the inspector. It lets you know that it's actually set. If I were to, let's see if I can do that. Let's say I take this rifle and I, and I clear it. So now it's got nothing, no reference. If we go back, presumably, um, this would eventually reset. Maybe I got to reopen the <clears throat> the game manager class. Let me see if that works. Presumably, it's going to tell you that this is not set. It looks like it's taken a second to update. Maybe I have to actually connect it uh, here or refresh. In any case, it was it was smart enough to know that when I first opened this, it knew where this was and that this was set. So you get a little bit of intelligence there. Let me reset this rifle. <clears throat> that IntelliSense is really nice. So you didn't get that before. Secondly, now I also have the ability to refactor this uh, much easier. I can change these out. You know, if I were to make an actual rifle class or a weapon class, it'd be much easier to go in here and, and change that as opposed to when it was all in one row. So let's hop ahead. That was that was the first refactor I did. And so I'm going to go to my repository and hop ahead to the next revision and check that out. Let's do a force checkout. <clears throat> now we can see here where I've done that. Also, this is kind of like a, I, I, I tend to follow writers' suggestions for a couple of reasons. One, because if my whole team is using Rider and they're using all the default suggestions, then we're all on the same page using automation. But Rider suggests, now I'm the kind of guy, by the way, who if I have a private member variable, uh, I always, always put an underscore in front of it. And I do this because when you're down here in a method and I have, let's say I have a var called num equal one, 
I want to be able to know that if I say my num plus num, that the my num is a private member variable that is not within scope of this uh, method, and that num is a variable that is within scope of the method. So this is not a great example because this is very, this is what, like a six line method. But if I had like a 20 line method, maybe like this one down here where I'm referencing my num and num, I wanna be able to very easily tell that this particular number does not exist in the scope or was not uh, declared within the scope of my method. So why do I say that? Because you can see here that these are technically private member variables, but we don't put an underscore in front of them. A writer will suggest to you not to put an underscore in front of them. And I am I'm in favor of this because <clears throat> they're not, it's like they are private member variables, but they're exposed. So they're kind of a special unique case to Unity where in a way, they're sort of public in, in, a, in a very weird, ex implicit or explicit way through the editor. So in that case, <clears throat> I try to treat them special. Writer treats them special. He, it bolds them so they're easier to see. So that's just why I went ahead and removed the underscore from the, the front of these private member variables. But I just wanted to make it clear that I always put a, an underscore in front of my private member variables, and that's why. <clears throat> um. So, so zero one says when you click on it, wouldn't it show it's in uh, that it's in the scope? Uh, yeah, if you click on it, it does. But sometimes I'm looking at code in GitHub, or you know, if you use other team sh team tools, like there's something called Upsource that is used for doing code reviews. I don't have that functionality, so um, I just try, in the spirit of just trying to make my code as readable as possible in every possible scenario, that's where that underscore really comes in clutch. Um, so moving on to the next commit here, let's uh, look at my notes. Okay, <clears throat> so <laughs> select level. There's a method on here called select level. Oh, look, wait, let me, let me, I, you're seeing a preview. Let me jump back, jump back. Let's go to this revision here. Okay, so we can see here that in the select level method, uh, we're actually breaking the law of Demeter. Now, I don't know what, at this point, we're just going to assume that I don't know what this is doing. I can see that it's setting some things active. It sets this level object active, which if we look up, we can see that it's actually another game object. So really don't know. I mean, based on the name, we know, we know it has something to do with the level. I'm assuming if I, I'm, I'm assuming it has to do with when I click on one of those levels uh, that we, we clicked on. Um, it sets the game object active. Then it goes down into the transform, gets the first child, sets the game object of that to active, so I don't really know what that child is. Um, then it does the same thing, it gets the first child, and the first child gets that game object, sets that active. So it's, we're breaking the law of Demeter, and it, in this context, you really just don't know what it's doing. Um, I, you know, Sean might look at this code today and say, uh, it, I probably sets, Maybe there's like an audio manager on one of those, and maybe there's some sort of set of scenes. I think there's a set of locations on those. It doesn't matter. At this point, I don't know what it's doing, and I don't think it belongs in the game manager class. In fact, if you look at it, it's it's calling this on the level itself. So why not let the level handle this? Um, and how you do that is I can't do it if the level's a game object. What I need to do is actually... Um, move this to some sort of level class. So if we look at through his, through Sean's code, there actually is a level class, right? So so I don't know, why why pass in a game object? Why not just pass in a level? Okay, so we've done that. I, I feel like that makes sense. If I'm gonna pass in a level, why not pass in the level? But now I don't I can't set these things as active, right? So because this is no longer a game object. But it seems like a job for level anyway, and it seems like when you select a level, this is a, all a part of it, what it does when it begins. So why not we just why don't we just create a method to, where we can push all this logic? So I'll make a method called, let's call this begin, all right? And then why don't I just grab all this code and put it into this begin method? And instead of obviously I can't call level, I'll just call game object dot select. Game object dot select and then game object.select. Now, all this same logic 
it's it's all the same stuff, but it's being that this responsibility is being passed down into the level. So now instead of doing all this here in the game manager, we'll just call level dot begin, and it and it can handle how it wants to do its thing, and and then we can just call level dot game object because level actually does. Uh, um, implement mono behavior so we know that it will have access to a game object so that seems like a that seems pretty nice we've cleaned this up the game manager is much easier to read now at, at least from this perspective now when we say select level you get a level and you just say level dot begin whatever that is we don't need to know it here in game manager we just need to know that the level can handle starting up um, now obviously there's some implications here in the editor so if we go up to the editor we had to reload the scene here. Um, these, it, if we were running, it's just not going to work. Watch, I'll show you this. Just so we can see if we click on a level, it doesn't know what to do. And that's because this move button here, um, it's, it's a class called move button. It expects to be able to uh, call game, I think it calls game manager dot select level. Um, so basically, we have to just go in here uh, to these, actually, it's not the move button. It's gonna be, it's gonna be these buttons here. I'm sorry. Each one of these uh, images that represents the level is its own button, and you can see that it each one of these has an on click method that calls game manager dot select level, but it's no longer working because we actually changed the signature of that method. If we go back to the game manager and look at the select level, the signature has changed from game object level to level class level so now the editor says hey this is missing that that method you had no longer exists so now all we got to do is just go in one by one select on the game manager and then uh find the select level and then what we can do is drag that level object onto uh, the game manager if i click on this you can see i can find it here much easier and and now that'll work so uh, but I've already done that ahead of time, and that's why I staged all these commits. So what we'll do is I'm going to go ahead and jump to this next commit here. And then you'll see that all this is in place. So we're going to just force the checkout. And all that code is in place. And if we go back here, it's going to ask me to reload. Yep, reload that. And again, if we look at these uh, buttons, we can see that they're all wired up correctly. And if we play the scene, knock on wood, this is going to work. Look at that. I got an error here. An error occurred while resolving package dependencies. That's probably because I just rolled the commit back, but uh, everything works, so that's nice. So we've made a very small iterative refactor and our code still works. That's the process. I'm gonna hop back into the chat and see if we if I missed any messages here. Oh no, the stream stopped? Hmm. Let me know if anyone's having issues with the stream. I see we got 43 watchers now. Thank you all for joining. Uh, what we're doing here, if you're just joining in, is uh, we're reviewing some code. We're going and doing some refactoring piece by piece. Um, so, all right. Looks like uh, just let me know what's going on with the stream. If, if anything issues arise, we're just going to keep trucking on through. So, all right. Let me refer back to my notes here. Um, so I put in my notes here, uh, when I was referring to a couple things happened. obviously this was breaking the law of Demeter, but another thing that, uh, I, I noticed was that I, it seemed to be a, a sort of, uh, a, I guess a version of what, what's called feature envy and feature envy is something is a programming term. Um, it's basically used to describe, I'm reading a definition here. If it sounds like I'm reading a definition, it's, just, it's used to describe a code smell in which one object gets at the fields of another object in order to perform some computation or make a decision. Now, if we look at this this begin method that we just added, the game object was referring and making a decision about what happens when a level starts. And so it was saying, the game manager was saying, well, I'm making the decision that whenever a level starts, I'm going to set that level's game object to be active. I'm gonna set its first child to be active. And then I'm gonna set its first child's child to be active. It's grandchild? Yes. Um, that is a decision that should be left up to the level. Because what if we change the structure of a level moving forward? I don't want to have to go and make that change in game manager. 
I want to make that change on the level because the level is the one who should who should be responsible for deciding what happens when it begins. So that's I wanted to mention that feature envy. Um, if, if they want to write that down, that's a that's a good thing to, to keep in mind when you're looking at responsibilities that a class has. All right, so let's look at the next commit. Um, okay, so if we look back up, talking about you know feature envy and responsibilities. If all of these objects here lived in their own namespace, like we talked about in the beginning, for instance, if rifle and chain gun uh, were actually weapon objects, and if doom ground spawner, air spawner, and regular spawner were all spawner objects, and the world was a world objects, and the levels were level objects, then presumably they would all live in their own namespace. So, okay, they live in their own namespace, well, you'd kind of get a code spell, right? Because then the game manager would have to reference, it would have to have using statements for each one of those individual namespaces. And that potentially is a code smell that the game manager is responsible for way too much. Also, there's a bit of inflexibility here because if you take a look at what are at the names and how this works, you see you've got the regular ground spawner and you've got the doom ground spawner. Well, if you go back in and take a look at the uh, actual project, you can see that there's five regular levels and there's one Doom level. So what that tells me is that each one of these levels shares the same spawner. All right. What if I wanted to add another type of level? What if I wanted to add a Skyrim level? You know, I wanted to have Doom, Skyrim, and then what are considered regular levels. What if I wanted one of the levels to have a different spawner? Maybe in this snowy level, I wanted to have a snowy animal spawner. And this desert level, I wanted to have a desert animal spawner. Um, so considering that flexibility, considering how my project might change, it seems to me that all of these spawners, oh, all of these spawners, I mean, all of these regular levels share the same spawner. So I'm seeing inflexibility. So what do we do here? Well, I just mentioned two different things. One is that feature envy. One is the fact that the game manager is referencing all these different things. And the other is the inflexibility of the fact that these all these levels share the same spawner. How do we address that? Well, I think we address that by moving all of these out of the game manager and onto the level class. So what that looks like is we go into the level class here and we start adding the serialized fields to represent. And for now, we'll just make them just cancel this. For now, we'll just make them game object, ground spawner. And then we're going to make an air spawner. And then we're going to make, um, what was it? We had the gun, right? And then, and then we have this object called levels. And basically that's going to be like the if, if you look at the code, it's basically the parent. So we'll call it game object and we'll call this the parent. And so now what that allows us to do is to take all this responsibility and move it off of the game manager. I forget if world has to be a part of that, but we'll take a look at the, uh, we'll take a look at the, the commits. Um, and basically anywhere where we're referencing those things. Uh, okay, here it is. So now we say, here in the game manager where we had select level, it's setting all these things active, but it doesn't really need to do that here. This is also a decision point that belongs to the level. So now what we can do is we can just say, hey, parent, set active, true. Ground spawner, again, we're gonna set that to active. And then so on and so forth. We're just gonna jump ahead because I have the commit. Um, and there's also some thing, there's also some changes we have to make to the um, the editor to rewire these things. Um, but just so you see, what I've done here is we've moved all of these objects down into the begin method of level. And so now that responsibility belongs to the level. And if it ever has to change, or if the rules ever change, you only have to change that in one place. For instance, as you may have noticed, the Doom level doesn't have an air spawner. For whatever reason, it only want, um, the way it was, we, we had the project, it was only taking advantage of the ground spawner which is fine. So what we do is, hey, we might say that the gun is a requirement of every single level, so it can't be null. The parent is also, in this case, a requirement, but 
you might have levels that only have an air spawner or only have a ground spawner. So now we've baked in this, this rule into this level code. Uh, oh my gosh, there's a tornado watch here. That's weird. Well, if the stream cuts out, there's a tornado barreling down on me. Um, now we moved uh, moved that business rule here that says, hey, look, either one of these can be null. So now that's been pulled out of the game manager. And now all the game manager does whenever someone cl uh, clicks select level is it just calls level.begin. And then it sets this current level object, which again, we're taking a very iterative approach, which you should always do when you refactor. Um, I'm not really concerned about that right now. I'm just trying to hit one piece at a time. I don't know what this world.setActive is either and how that plays into this. But what's important is that we've made this change and now I can go back to my editor here and reload it. And if I've done my job as a programmer, I can hit play and still run this scene. There you go. So now, if we look at the structure of this project, we hop into the game manager. Uh, we can see, look at this. Now the game manager no longer cares about any of those other things. All it knows about is the world. And if we look at this world object where that that now that houses all the levels, I actually haven't changed any of this. The only thing that's changed is that if you look at each level, each one has its own reference to its own spawner, uh, ground and air spawner and rifle, and then its parent object. Um, which I think eventually we'll, we'll be able to remove. And again, if we look at the Doom level, now the Doom level has, uh, it's it's not referring to an air spawner, it's referring to a Doom ground spawner, and it's got now it's got a chain gun instead of the, uh, the rifle. And so now you can see we have the flexibility with this very small change, it really was a very small change, uh, now I have this crazy amount of flexibility. I can create a Skyrim level, I can create all sorts of, new uh, complicated iterations that you know I could not do before. And now the code, if I think you'd agree, is much readable. When I have to, if I'm a new developer coming into Game Manager, I can very easily, I don't, I don't get bogged down by, okay, this thing is responsible for levels, uh, rifles, you know, or rather weapons, and all this sorts of thing. It's just, hey, look, it, all it does is it's responsible for holding the uh, holding the method that gets click, gets called by buttons or other aspects of the code that just queues up the next level. And realistically, I might move this behavior to like a level manager in the future if I want to really encapsulate that. But in this case, we're taking an iterative approach. We don't need to go that far. All right, let's take a look at the, the chat here, see if uh, anything ro has rolled through. Um... Thank you, Mr. Senator, for uh, for the kind comment there. Uh, level spawner could be an interface. Sure, sure, could be. Um, okay, uh, Mathis says that he changed the writer behavior to put a to put a underscore in front of the uh, field, and I think that's that's totally valid. I mean, you know, I I've been trying when it first suggested that to me. That was my first instinct too, but I I. I, maybe I take this for granted, but I feel like the folks working on the on Rider and and the integration between Rider and Unity, they're thinking about this more than I am. So I kind of just trust them um, with their suggestions, and that's what I did. I said, look, if if they think that I shouldn't put an underscore in front of serialized fields, they have definitely thought about it way more than I have because they're literally a team of guys who are working on this integration. Uh, for 40 hours a week. And so I kind of just accepted their suggestion. But like you said, you could definitely change that. You don't have to go with a writer's suggestions. Um, Tron says, doesn't matter if you use underscore or not. Okay, yeah, so we're talking about, yeah. So he's just saying, look, as long as you're consistent, that that that's all that matters. And I've worked on, I to this day in my day job, I work on a code base where there is no uh, uh, stylistic guide or standard. And it's very jarring to, in just one uh, one ticket, you're working one wor one ticket, seeing like four different code styles from four different developers. So consistency is super important. <laughs> the foreman says, "This is why game managers banned from all my project. It simply ends up having it always ends up having responsibility for all kinds of things." Yeah, I mean, look, I, I wouldn't. I personally would say, I, look, that's a good rule of thumb, I guess. It's a good, like, code smell to say, 
that anything with the word manager on the end of it in general, you know, is like, what is this? It's like having service or controller, these things that are named um, in, in such a, not generic, but there's there's just so much baked into that name that sometimes it gets overused. I mean, why not call the player player manager? The player is the player class is managing the player, right? So I, that sort of thing can get overused, and and I can see where that is like um, uh, that is like a code smell. So yeah, game manager it is responsible for a lot right now, and maybe like I said, maybe we might have a level manager, and maybe all this all this in this game manager will get moved out into something else. But for right now, we'll just keep it as that. Okay, cool. So let's move on to the next refactor here. I got one more that I did. Uh, so we're going to go through that. Did I? Yeah, I did. Okay. So the next thing was, uh, right. So basically, there's there's more behavior that could be moved to the level class. And I'll tell you where it is. Because uh, the next thing I thought was, uh, as I was looking through this code, was, okay, I changed select level to reference this level. Why do I still have a game object for current level? Shouldn't that be a level two? Well, before I do that refactoring, I have to consider where this is actually being used. So if I click on usages, we can see this is being used in a, quite a few places. We've got a class called cam, and that references this. We've got a class called Weapon, okay. Wow, there's a weapon class. How do you like that? It's referencing it. We've got a class called Spawner. How do you like that? There's actually a Spawner class. You know, these are these are things that it's good. Now I'm seeing these usages. I'm learning more about the code. We've got a class called UI Manager, Move Button. Now the only class that really does anything fancy, and I'm I'm telling you this because I already looked through the code. You'd want to look through each one of these. Um, the only one that really utilizes and does anything fancy is the move button. So let's click on the move button, see what that does. Now, the first thing you want to do, I would say, is look at what the move button's dependencies are and what the member variables are to get an idea of what it's doing. Okay, so the move button has, up here at the top, it has an index, which is an int. It has a scene count, which is an int. It's got, again, current level so now we've got current level both referenced on the game manager and now we've got current level here on the move button and then we've got this on move action okay so you can see here that on start here's where it sets up its own dependencies so this is not dependency injection this is the opposite uh it's actually reaching out to this singleton the game manager and saying give me your current level whatever that might be it actually gets to transform but then it says on that current level, go ahead and find for me an object uh, with the name scenes and then get the child count, okay? And then it sets the index to zero. So just real quick, why don't we go back over to Unity here and then let's take a look at a level and then we'll expand it. Let me make this active so you can see what this is actually saying. I know this is probably really small, um, but we see we've got level and we see we've actually got an object called scenes, which again, going back, you'd see it looks for that, scenes, and then it gets a child count. Okay, so what this tells me is that, uh, let me see if I can zoom out and see this, activate these. These are the scenes. So each one of these is a scene that it moves through. You remember that functionality. Um, in fact, I can just show you. You deactivate all this. Play. Hopefully I didn't break anything. We can see that when we hit move, it's literally just iterating through these three scenes. So if we look at this on the side here, open up scenes, uh, you can see that every, every time I click move, it's moving and, it, and it's activating each scene. And that's how it, it clips through these scenes here. So that's a lot of logic that to me actually seems like it should probably live on the level, meaning we should expose a, a, a method. Let me put it a little higher so you all can see it. All right, we should probably expose a method called move and all the move button should do is just call level.move. Uh, so we don't actually have an, uh, a reference to the current level right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use, for the sake of making this real easy, game manager dot instance dot current level. Okay, okay, What actually what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna add a private level level 
just for now, what we really should be doing is call level dot, calling level.move, and that's it. Uh, and then invoking this on move method. Um, so that means we got to move all of this logic up into the level, right? All right, so obviously there's some stuff going on here. There's a local function. I'll tell you what, I've been coding for a long time and I've never, ever, 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 this is my anecdote here, ever had a need for a local function. I don't know if there's some sort of optimization with a compiler uh, or something like that of having a local function called, or just having a local function, but I've never done it. So I can't really speak to if I recommend this. To me, it's just seems like it hides some stuff, uh, but neither here nor there. Seems like what it does is it gets the current level from that list of scenes um, depending on some index. So what that tells me is that we're probably going to have to ex uh, expose serialize field, uh, a list of game objects, and I'm gonna make them game objects for now. Maybe, maybe they're gonna be something else later that are the scenes. Now, I'm gonna say one thing about this before I move forward, um, and you'll see this when I go to my next commit. Scenes, I don't like to use that word. Just like I called this method begin, because start is already a unity term, scenes is a unity term. So, it'd be my preference here to call this something like locations. Because when you start using words that are not necessarily reserved by unity, but are pretty well understood that they are unity terms, it can be confusing for a developer who comes in and says, hey, this, ob this variable is called scene. Maybe I, can, maybe I can load it with the scene manager or something like that. Or they might assume that they could uh, call scene dot scene index or whatever, whatever uh, properties are available on a, on a unity scene object. So it'd be my preference here to keep the terminology sort of Unity agnostic, we'll call this locations. Um, and then so obviously you're gonna wanna have an index, uh, private int index of current location. Right, so this is the same logic that we've got here. Now, um, so now instead of calling get currency, I mean, if we really wanted to, we could just try to just trying to keep this iterative. Let's say we'll make our own get current scene um, method here, and it's going to take in an int index. And what it's going to do is return um, locations. Oops, locations, and then reference the index. Sorry, boom. Oh, how do you uh? Well, I'm having a brain fart. This is this is what happens when you code live. Oh, void. It's going to return a game object that is the current scene, right? And then we're gonna rename this index. Actually, I'm gonna do this to make this e easier. I'm gonna call this index. That way we have it here. We don't have to change much. And then scene count is actually going to be locations dot count. Right, and so basically, this is doing exactly what the move button logic is doing. So we don't really need to have this anymore. But there's still a problem. This on move, um, this on move action, which I'm, which presumably has a bunch of other classes listening into it expects to be passed in an index, right? So what is that all about? Well, let's take a look at where on move is actually called. Uh, we're gonna do a find usages here. And I uh, see the camera uses it. So let's pop into the camera class. So as we can see here, that when, when on move gets called, uh, it gets the transform of the current scene. And it does that by breaking the law of Demeter here. It gets the current level, it looks at its transform, it gets the first child, and then it gets, which is that scene object, and then it uses the index that's passed in by move to figure out what that is, so that it could basically, all it's really doing is it's setting the position of the camera to, um, 
to that scene. So what we could actually do <clears throat> is we could expose the current, might as well just expose the current scene as a public, uh, public property. So why don't we just do that? Public, I'll just do game object, and then we'll say current location. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll just return locations uh, at the index. And then so now if we go to that camera logic, really we can just do this dot current. Oh, that's right, because this isn't a level yet. We'll have to go back to the, sorry, I'm kind of, I don't want to jump too far around, but basically the whole point of this was that I wanted to make this an actual level. Um, so now that I've done the, the on move stuff or the move button changes, what I can actually do is um, now this is going to be a reference of a level. And what I'll do is I'll just say, uh, instead of referencing the level and the scene count and all this and the index, we don't need any of this anymore. Apologize if this is kind of like very quick, we're going to make this. Um, we're going to make this get the current level from the game manager and then just set it here. Now, why is it complaining? That's a good question. Cannot resolve. Oh, duh. I miss, I put a capital. So now we've, we've simplified this code and now what's happening here is that, um, I'm just gonna do this for now. Not O, zero. What's happening now is all we do is we get the current level from the game manager instance, and now we call level.move, and now we still have to figure out about this invoke that accept, that expects to be an int. And to solve that, what we're gonna do is we're no longer gonna pass a we're no longer gonna pass an int here because what we can basically do is just get the current level dot transform, and now all this logic still works. Um so long story short, let's hop on to the next commit, and I'm going to pop into the comments in a second to see if I went too fast and if I need to go back. But if we pop forward into the commit here, yeah, let's do check out that revision, force the checkout. We can see that the level class is now responsible for this move, right, like we mentioned. Um, it now has this current location, which in this case, I actually returned it as the transform because that's how it's basically used. If we look at the, the usages, you can see this cam uh, logic, which basically when you, uh, it's used to set the camera to the location of that particular level or a location. We can also see that another usage of this is the weapon. And again, it just used to position the weapon into that particular location. Uh, of the current level. So those are the uh, basic changes. And if we go back to the game manager, just to kind of wrap it all up, we can see that now the game manager references a level as the current level. And I'm not even going to get into singletons right now and why I don't like this. But as it is, it's fine. You know, we've got the level. Now we're passing all that behavior to level.begin. Uh, we're setting the current level now whenever someone selects a level. And now, anytime we hit that move button, it is referencing the current level and it's calling level.move and then just invoking the on move. So, let's go back to the comments, see what we got here. <clears throat> Take a sip of my coffee. Oh, a lot of comments. <laughs> manager, manager. I think managers are fine. I have lots of them, but game manager doesn't tell you at all what it's supposed to do. I think that's a fair comment. That's a very fair comment. What, what is a game manager? Just manages the game. Isn't this whole thing a game? <laughs> Maybe it's called hunting, hunting manager or level. I don't know. Yeah. Um, let's see. I had, I had a lot of things called manager when making jobs and working with ECS. Yeah. Well, the old ECS code was very had a lot of boilerplate that were, you know, didn't require, but the naming convention to make it obvious was, you know, you'd call things like system, something system, something job. Um, I, I treat the game manager as an entry point for my code. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So you see that just goes to show everyone has their own convention, you know? And so realistically, the best thing you could do in my opinion, is choose the convention that is the most obvious to the largest amount of developers. And that way it's easy for most people to, to get on board. But it's not a perfect science. You're never, I mean, it's not, it's not perfect. You're never gonna be able to please everyone or be obvious to everyone. Local functions that are pure functions will not allocate. Hmm, 
Others will have boxing allocations. Okay. I figured there was something like that. Um, hi. Yeah, hey, how's it going? Just an FYI. Jason uh, could not be here today, uh, it seems. Let me hop on Discord and see if he ever popped back. Um, you know, I kind of sprung this stream on, stream on him last night, so no hard feelings that he couldn't make it. Um, we usually stream at on two uh, Wednesdays during the day, Eastern Standard Time. And last yesterday, like last night, I was like, hey, can you stream tomorrow morning at 5, which is noon his time? And uh, I know he's got a lot going on with work, so no big deal. Um, when will I be live again? So we're still playing with some times. It's probably going to be next Thursday. Um, all right. Huh. Interesting about this index mod scene count. Tron says that that's going to make an internal CPU stutter. I'm going to read into that. All right, all right. Yeah, so Tron's, me mentions that he's protective of his junior devs, and you should be. Because, look, it's not, you never know the level of expertise that someone is going to bring to the table when they're working on code. And to some extent, that shouldn't matter. You want to enable people to help you. If you have a, if you've written your code in such a way that it's so fancy that uh, a senior, uh, only a senior developer or an experienced developer can look at it and code to it, and then you're kind of just messing with yourself because that means you're limiting the amount of people that you can. Oh man, you're sorry. You're 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 limiting the amount of people that can help you. That's funny, man. <laughs> Tron, you tricked me there. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Internal CPU stutter. He was saying. That it's just hard to read and it makes his own brain skip. It makes my brain skip too, man. <laughs> That's hilarious. That well, would ride over my head. So it happens when you're streaming. Um, or maybe I'm just dumb. <laughs> uh, shouldn't the on move be in the level class uh, as you want the event to be invoked whenever you move? That's a good point. That's a very good point, Artan Artanic. Um, I guess it overcomplicates things though because now... Anyone who subscribes to everyone that would need to subscribe to on move uh, would now need to update its uh, its subscription whenever the level changes, which ne isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it does. It's just something to think about. What I would say is it probably in the interim, I would say I would rename it to on move button clicked for the sake of clarity. And, and that, you know, and then whoever needs to make that decision later on can make a better, a more educated decision because they know this is the button. A button is calling this. There's a disjoint there. Um, and then that, that might be a code smell to say, what, we probably should join this because, you know, what if the button's clicked, but the, but then the level is not in a position to move, but then now I'm, all my other code is firing off its move uh, reaction, you know, so that's a good point. If it's if it's hard to write, it should be hard to read. Ha. It's true. I mean, look, I think writing something like uh where is it? This is kind of hard to write. This is not intuitive. You're just like, okay, so the plus plus goes before the index, so I know I'm incrementing before uh before it gets used. And then I'm using percent sign that's modulus. I don't know, but like I suck at math, so every time I, I see modulus, my brain just stops working. I'm like, okay, I know that it it's like a looping thing or it goes back to zero. But yeah, so you're not going to be able to avoid some code like this. Eventually, you know, you're going to have to write code like this, like re regular expressions and things that they're super valuable. This right here is like incredibly valuable. It takes a lot of complexity of, about having to track you know, oh, have I gone past the limit of this thing? Okay, if I have, we'll then set it to zero. Is that more readable? Yeah, but this is kind of nice. It's it's nice to have. Um, maybe I would pump this into a, I'd pump this into a method that that is, makes it clearer. But um, it's probably a dumb question, but I have never seen on move dot invoke. Is that a boolean check? Oh, the question mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I forget what I think it's called null propagation. Um. It's probably not the right word. Let me go back to that. So yeah, it's basically the same as saying any. Uh, it's the same as doing that. And you can see in writer here that it actually puts this 
this green bubble under here and or underline it lets you know. Oh, no, yeah, no propagation. So Rider says, do you want to use no propagation? I say, yeah, it just changes it. It's a it's a it's a feature of C sharp now that you know you can just check. And if if this comes back as null, it's just going to 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 not call it. It's not going to do it. Let's 